Now, before we get into it, just a quick question. How many of you guys, I'm not going to say enjoy virtual work because I know you don't. <laughs> I'm not, not going to waste your time. But how many of you understood the process of virtual work in this class? I know Yong's class is a whole different story, but for this class, how was the process of virtual work? Pretty good? The nice thing is, is if you understand the process of virtual work, today's going to be a piece of cake. It's actually going to be the identical process, we just use different equations. So that's the nice part. But back to the fun, today is the last theory lecture that you will be tested on. On Thursday, we're going to do kind of the mathematical example for the rayleigh ritz method. And next week, it's going to be solely finite elements. Now, I've talked about finite elements a lot, and you guys have seen that. It's, it's a complex topic. But ask or answer me this. Do you think you're ready for the finite element method? Who thinks, you know what, Clayton? I need to know everything I need to know. I'm ready for it. Or how many of you are thinking, you know what, that's a graduate topic. I'm not ready for it at all. Who's ready for it? Yes. Isn't that crazy? You, at this point, even though you may not know it, are ready for the finite element method. If you were my graduate students and I were to do a review of everything you need to know, it's literally just what we covered in this course. The next step would actually be the finite element method. Think about what we've accomplished in this course so far. By the end of this course, let's say we don't even talk about the real Earth's method and just focus on virtual work. If I were to give you a beam in real life, and I were to say, you know what, the beam is steel, it behaves elastically, could you solve for the stresses and strains in that beam? Yes, which is wonderful. You think about what we do in this course, that's exactly what we did. In your design classes, even though you don't really see it, all of the equations that you have, steel, concrete, whatever, timber even, they all come from this class, which is nice because now when you move on to 374, or most of you are just finishing 374, you know where everything comes from. Again, it's not going to be directly shown in the equations, but all the beams are based on Euler Bernoulli beams. And you know what? You could, if you wanted to, I'm not going to recommend anything, of course. If you wanted to design a beam, and you know what it's saying, the code book kind of sucks. Code book kind of sucks. Who thinks the code book kind of sucks? Yeah, code book can be a little bit weird to deal with. If you wanted to, you could analyze the beam yourself. And if you were to plot a beam, and you know that the yield stress is 400 MPa, and your maximum stress is 200, could you stamp that beam as safe? Yes. Is that crazy? You're saying, well, hold on, wait. Why do we need the code book then? That's a great question. Who's in 374? Can you design not using the code book? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Why do we design using the code book though? Consistency, of course. I just raised a big question for you guys. We design using a code book, but technically we don't need the code book. Code books used to save your ass. <laughs> In essence, if a structure were to fail, you as the structural engineer who stamped it, you get to go to court, lucky you. As we know, structural engineering is a very serious topic. If I didn't design this beam correctly, well, we're all in for a lot of trouble. If you were to go to the actual court, though, and say, well, you know what, it failed, but I did everything the code said, that's your kind of get out of jail free card. If you go to court and say, well, I thought that this would work, <laughs> it violates the code, but I thought it would be fine, well, then you're going to face some penalties. But it's still important to note this. I know I just scared you, and after that, everyone's going to say, well, I'm just going to design what the code tells me to. But there's some aspects of the code that are lacking. You just don't see them. Everything that you've learned in 374, 474, 479, and even the graduate classes, don't prepare you for any scenarios, or all the scenarios. 
A typical one is steel and torsion. You guys know torsion? We know that we can bend stuff, but we can also twist stuff. Twisting of materials is very complex. Very, very complex. You know what the steel code book tells you to do for torsion? It just has a clause that says, make sure it's good. There's no equations, there's no guidelines, it's up to you. So that's why it's important to learn how to actually simulate stuff. If I were to design something for torsion, what I would do if something were to fail, I'd bring my models to court. Now, that, of course, this is not legal advice. <laughs> Don't mistake it. But this is why we need to know this stuff, is because the code book doesn't give you every scenario. And the scenarios that it does give you, well, it's nice to know where exactly it comes from. So by the end of this course here, we're able to take basically simple situations, find the displacements, stresses, strains, and failure modes, which is great. Now, when I said simple scenarios, what were some assumptions that we used in this course? Who remembers? What did we do in all of the math to make our lives easier? What do you think? For instance, could I apply Euler Bernoulli beam to everything? No. Why? What were some assumptions in Euler Bernoulli beams? No moments? No, it has moments. Did we consider Poisson effects? In your Euler Bernoulli equations, did we have the Poisson ratio in any of them? No. Did we consider the axial load placed on Euler Bernoulli beams? No. Did we assume linear elastic materials? Yes. Did we assume plane sections remain plane? Yes. And the list goes on and on. This course, it says in the title, is an introduction. And that's what I hope you guys took from it. It was an introduction to show you how exactly you simulate things. The next step would be to address those assumptions. And that's where we get into the finite element method. As we can see, even under all those assumptions, it starts getting pretty complex. The finite element method is a way where we take a very big problem and we split it into a series of smaller problems. That's why it's called finite elements. What we do is we take a structure, let's say this podium, and we break it into little pieces. Each one of those pieces is called elements, and there's a finite number of them. <laughs> That's why it's called the finite element method. And we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to finish up today with the rayleigh ritz method, which is basically an alternative to virtual work. I know you guys don't like virtual work. Who, who likes virtual work? Yeah, it's exactly what I thought. No one likes virtual work. rayleigh ritz method is an alternative method, and it's actually the simpler of the two. But one thing I want to stress before we get into it today is there's more than two methods. It's not just fine, or it's not just virtual work or Rayleigh Ritz. We have point collocation. We have the Gallerkin method. A bunch of different methods. These are just the two that we are showing you guys. So that's kind of my spiel for the end of the semester. <laughs> uh, assignment ten again on Thursday when we cover a mathematical example in class. It will be the question from assignment ten. So if you follow along in class, you'll have the assignment done by the end of class. It's pretty simple. Is there any questions from you to me before we begin about this course in general? Yes. The final is cumulative, yes. The final is 50 questions. Five questions will be from topics one and two, so midterm one. 15 questions will be from midterm two. And then 30 questions will be from what we covered recently. I put that breakdown on the final exam section, so if you already forgot what I said, it's on in class under the final exam. I have two practice finals up. I don't have three because I wasn't given the third one. <laughs> I don't know where it went, basically. I will do a review session for one of them, either 2014 or 2015, because for USRIs, the 50% was met. If we get to 75%, I will do two of them. One thing to keep in mind is that for each exam, I'm going to split the review session into kind of part one, part two, because 50 questions will just take forever. I think it takes us about two hours to get through 25 questions. So for each final exam, I would 
split it into two. So if you guys meet this 70, 75, I think it was that, that percent marker, and I'm doing a review for both exams, it would be four review sessions. So it's going to be quite a bit. The exam, I believe, it's on E-class already, but I believe it's December 16th, which is Thursday. I'm not sure. And it's from 2 to 5 at night. That doesn't come from me. That came from kind of the university. The university said, if you have a Tuesday, Thursday lecture at 8 a.m., this is your exam time. So that's how that date came to be. The exam, as I kind of mentioned, is going to be multiple choice. It's going to be the same format as before, but it's going to be written. And the reason why is because I want you all to show work. The reason why is because I can give you partial marks. I've seen a lot of midterm questions where students come to me and say, Clayton, I don't know why I got this wrong. And they show me their work and everything is correct. One calculation mistake. In the old final exams, if you get a multiple choice wrong, zero out of four. But now if you can show me your work and I can just say, oh, it was just that one problem, well, then I can give you three out of four or even 3.5 out of four. That will help bring the average up and it will make you guys a little bit happier <laughs> before the holidays. Again, the idea of a written exam isn't to punish you. If you are 100% certain of your answer and you don't want to show any work, well, you'll still get four out of four. Or I guess there will be out at two since it's 50 questions. You don't have to show your work. Showing your work is just to help me give you bonus marks. Again, you will not be penalized in any way if you don't want to show any work. It's just to help with bonus marks. Is there any questions about the final exam? It's going to be a written exam, so you're going to have to print it or put it in an iPad or whatever you want. And because of that, there will be additional time for scanning. So how many, so let's say the exam is three hours. How much extra time would you need to print the exam at the beginning and then scan and upload it after? Would 10 minutes be sufficient? 10 minutes? No? You're smiling, so chances are, what are you going to say, half an hour? <laughs> what, what would be good for you guys? 10 minutes would be good for you guys. Okay, then how about 15? 15 minutes? Perfect. Even if it takes you two minutes, you have an extra 10 minutes on the exam, perfect. Either way, I want you to all be nice and happy before the holidays. They're coming up quick. Anyone have any fun plans? Not study. Not study? Isn't that the best? I find the problem though is after you work so hard throughout the semester, you just feel so guilty to not study. Like something feels just so wrong. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. So any other questions about the final? Yes. So you don't have a printer? <laughs> uh, do you have a tablet or anything? No? Okay, so then you can just write it on loosely for each question or whatever paper works, and then you can just scan and upload that. All right, so no exam questions. Again, today's the last topic. The course is basically coming to an end. So before we begin, I just want to say thank you all. <laughs> I really didn't know what to expect this semester, especially after teaching online for the past, I guess, past semester. It's been fantastic. You guys have all been great. Uh, you've been nice for the most part. <laughs> for the most part, I have to include that because I know some students don't like the online assignments, <laughs> specifically how to input variables, but that'll be something fixed for later semesters. So I apologize for the frustration if you encountered it, and it'll be fixed next year. But you guys aren't taking this next year, so you probably don't even care. <laughs> All right, so we're going to begin, unless there's any questions, no questions. Have you guys all filled out USRIs? Yes? Give me a terrible review? Yes? Yes? No, I, I, I want you to be honest. That's the main thing about USRI. Again, I won't see them until basically February. So you don't have to worry about it getting in the way of anything. So the Rayleigh Ritz method, that's, that's why you all came here today. Does anyone look ahead? Anyone know anything about this? It's actually really simple. And the reason why is because we already covered half of it. Remember when we did strain energy? This whole method is going to be based around that concept, strain energy. 
So the Rayleigh-Ritz method, just like virtual work, we said exact solutions, well, they kind of suck because we have to solve a differential equation. For our beams under axial load, it was this one. For Euler Bernoulli beams, it was this one. What can happen is we can actually combine these together to find the equation of a beam column, but that gets even more complex. Again, you guys don't want to be solving these in realistic scenarios. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Rayleigh-Ritz method to approximate one of these solutions. So that's going to be another hint for the final. I will ask you a question like this. Either what is Rayleigh-Ritz or what is virtual work? Is it an exact solution or is it an approximation? Well, we know it's going to be an approximation. There's a key thing. Question for you all though, is it possible to obtain an exact solution using these methods? Yes. If you pick, or sorry, if your exact solution is a polynomial of let's say the fourth order, and you were to approximate it using a fourth order polynomial, you'll find that they are the exact same. The thing is, is more often than not, exact solutions, maybe not necessarily with these two, but in general, exact solutions aren't polynomials, they're radicals. So if I'm using a polynomial to approximate a radical, could I ever get the exact solution? No, but I could get very close to it. And that's what we're goal, or that's what the goal is. Now, unlike virtual work, the Rayleigh-Ritz method is actually based upon minimizing the potential energy of a system. That's the whole goal here, minimizing the potential energy. In essence, this is the equation we are going to work with. You're going to see a lot of similarities between the Rayleigh-Ritz method and the virtual work method. In the virtual work method, we had external virtual work is equal to internal virtual work. For the Rayleigh-Ritz method, this is our equation we're working with. So this right here is the potential energy of the system, and it's equal to basically two components. The first one is the internal strain energy. So question for you, have we already covered internal strain energy? Yes. Have you guys already calculated U bar in your assignments? Yes. So this part's actually not that new. The nice thing too is this other term on the other side, well, that's going to be the work done by external forces. Indirectly, did we cover work done by external forces in virtual work method? Did we take our forces and multiply them by displacement? Yes. You're going to see that the equation for work is going to be identical to the external virtual work equation. So even though this looks brand new, this will be something you've indirectly already seen before. But then we got some questions. Why are we going to minimize the potential energy? That's the first one. We already said that the whole method is based on minimizing the potential energy. But the question is why? Other ones include how to calculate this internal strain energy and the work done. So in this particular case, even though you've seen it before and you trust me that you've seen it before, I guarantee if I were to ask you right now what this is, no one's going to answer me. <laughs> Same thing with this over here. So we're going to figure out what those are, and then exactly how do we minimize potential energy. This one should be self-explanatory. If I have a function and I want to minimize it, who remembers what we do? Think back to math. If I have a parabola, and I want to minimize it, find that minimum point, what would I do? Take the derivative, set it equal to zero. That's going to be the whole goal of what we do here. As we're going to see, we're going to take this function, and we're going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. So the first thing that we're going to answer, though, is well, why minimize the potential energy? So the potential energy of the system is actually related to the stability of the system. If you're designing a structure, do you want it to be stable or do you want it to be unstable? I know you're all laughing, thinking, huh, unstable, of course. But no, of course, we want it to be stable. So if we were to take a ball here, and this is kind of the analogy for this stability of a system. If I were to take a ball, which is originally at rest at the center, and I were to move it a little bit to the left and then release it, what's going to happen to the ball? going to move, but where is it going to move to? 
the center. It's going to move back to the original position. The analogy to this would be if this was a beam and I were to load it and then unload it, well, it's going to go back to its original system. So this right here is what we would call a stable system. And in this system, our potential energy is minimal. Now we have different types of equilibrium. Another one would be a flat surface and we had a ball. So if I were to take this ball and now move it to the left and let go, is the ball going to move? No. It's going to find equilibrium again, but in a different location. So this right here, the potential energy would be constant, and this would be considered neutral equilibrium. Now the one that you guys all like would be something like this. If I were to take my ball and move it a little bit to the left and let go, well, the ball is saying, see you later, it's going away. This right here would be a scenario with maximum potential energy or unstable equilibrium. So of course, we want this scenario right here. And in this case, we want minimum potential energy. So again, the goal of the Rayleigh-Ritz method is we're going to find an approximate solution that satisfies this idea of basically having stable equilibrium. That's what we want. That's what we're going at. So if we said if we want to do this, we need to find two things. We need to find internal strain energy, and we need to find the work done on the system. Who remembers what internal strain energy was? The formula for it. You guys remember? It was pretty simple. If I wanted that U bar, who remembers that formula? No one? Too tired? Don't care anymore. Last lecture, what is it? Basically December 1st. All it was was the stresses times the strains. That was it. You say, okay, the strain energy density of a material, U bar, is the area under the curve. So let's say that we were to take a, a uniaxial test, and this looks basically like concrete. Well, we remember saying that the strain or the total. The strain energy density was going to be the area under this curve, which can be found as the derivative of sigma ij with respect, or yeah, derived with respect to epsilon ij. Now, this is for a nonlinear material, and we said in this course we're dealing with linear elastic. So the area under the curve turns out just to be a triangle. And we say, okay, if this is the case, it's just going to be one half of sigma ij times epsilon ij. Now, do you remember it? <laughs> no, still no. As we can see, it's, it's nice and easy. But here's where a lot of students went wrong on the assignments, and this is what I want to emphasize now. Is this the total strain energy? The total strain energy? No, this is the density, the strain energy density. If I want to find a total strain energy, what do I need to do to this thing right here? If I know the density, what do I need to do to find the total? Integrate it over the volume. It's the same thing. If I wanted to find the mass of something and add the density, I need to multiply it by volume. And that's essentially what we have to do with this to find the total strain energy. So this is for one component. If we were to consider all the components, we get this nice big long expression right here. But something's going to be nice, and we're going to talk about that later on. So to determine the total strain energy, we need to take this function here, and we need to integrate it over the initial domain. So we're saying that, OK, the total strain energy is going to be equal to the integral of our strain energy density, which is this part right here, over the initial domain. So this is something that we didn't really talk about in virtual work method, but it does apply, and that is this. This part right here is easy. It's just this equation. But notice what we did right here. We swap the domains. Because what happens is this. We're integrating over the initial domain. If we, in our assignment for a beam, we went from 0 to L, basically from 0 to H, and then 0 to B. But if I were to take my beam and start compressing it, is the length still going to be L? No. Is the height still going to be h? No. So this is one thing that we actually use in the finite element method a lot is the domain actually changes. 
So if you want the actual formula, we have to take into account the fact that our domain is changing every time. But we're going to ignore that and say, okay, if we have small deformations, well, then our volume is not changing very much, so we can integrate it over the initial domain. This is something that we use, or sorry, we solve using the finite element method. In the finite element method, if I wanted to apply, let's say, 100 kilonewtons to this beam, I'm not just going to 100 kilonewtons. We do iterations. So we go 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 3 to 4, and we slowly increase it. And between each of those iterations, we keep re-updating the domain. So that's kind of our way of getting around this. But it's something that needs to be considered. For you in this class, though, we don't worry about it. We just go over the kind of the initial domain. It's not too bad. I can see that the animations didn't work, so <laughs> we'll go through this nice, have a nice fun time. So we can derive the total strain energy for a beam because it's a case of a continuum. And this is where I said it gets a little bit nice. <laughs> well, this is going to be fun. So this right here is all the strains times all the sigmas. For Euler Bernoulli beams, how many strain components did we have? Euler Bernoulli beams. Does anyone remember? It has to be between one and six. So guess a number. Four, three, two. We only had one. That was nice. Epsilon one one. So this summation right here, where it's epsilon, or sigma ij epsilon ij from ij is one to three, well it's actually just going to be sigma one one times epsilon one one divided by two. Remember, Euler Bernoulli beams are only non-zero strain component is epsilon one one. From there, we can say, okay, if we don't consider Poisson effects, what happens is that sigma 1, 1 is actually equal to E times epsilon 1, 1. Again, we're not considering Poisson effects. So from there, I can take these two epsilon 1, 1s and combine them together into epsilon 1, 1 squared. Now, the final thing that we do is we say, okay, epsilon 1, 1 for Euler Bernoulli beams, we know what that is. It's negative x2 times the second derivative of our deflection function. So I substitute that in there, and then I integrate over the domain. So our, our initial domain for an Euler Bernoulli beam would be 0 to b in the thickness direction, negative h over 2 to h over 2, and then 0 to l. And what happens is, is you get this term right here. And this was my favorite part about the assignment. You have no idea how many emails I've got saying, Clayton, I've inputted this right here, but it says I'm wrong. Whenever you see a base time type Q, there should be fireworks going off in your head, because that right there is the moment of inertia for a rectangle. So we can actually substitute that in right there. And for an oiled Bernoulli beam, this is going to be our strain energy density. My question for you now is this. Does this look similar to virtual work? Who remembers what the internal virtual work equation was? No one? Just finished the assignment on Monday and already forgot? Yep. It was EI. Well, let's go through it together. Virtual work was EI, which we have here. It was the second derivative of our deflection function, which we have here, and then it was multiplied by the second derivative of our virtual deflection function. If I were to take two second, or second derivatives and multiply them together, we get the square. The only real thing that has changed in this equation is we just have this divide by two. That's basically it. Question for you all. Where did this divide by two come from? Who remembers? Linear elastic. Remember, when we took the area of a triangle, it's one half. That one half is what shows up over here. So the key thing to take away is it's very similar to virtual work, but it's not quite exactly virtual work. But my question for you is, is this equation that bad? If I were to give you a beam with a length L and EI, can you solve this equation? You're saying yes, of course. 
I wonder why. You all just told me you can solve it. How are you going to solve it if you don't know why it is? Virtual work, remember, had an equation like this. How did we find the uh, virtual displacement function? How did you find that? Where did that come from? Because you needed this for virtual work. No one remembers? Yeah, you had a polynomial. So remember that y here is something that you will pick. It's the same thing as virtual work. In the end here, you will pick what exactly y is, which is going to be great. The second part is the work done by external forces, and this is simple. All we're going to do is take each external force and multiply it by its respective displacement. So for a continuum, what were our two external forces? Do you remember? I know no one likes continuums, even though this course is continuum mechanics. No? Traction vectors and body forces. So we have traction vectors acting over surfaces, and then we have body forces acting over the volume. So for the work done by external forces for a continuum, we basically have two components. We have the traction vectors integrated over the surfaces, and we have body forces integrated over the volume. So notice that each one is multiplied by that approximation function u, which in this case would be a vector. That's why we have the dot product. We have a vector here, we have a vector here. What happens when we dot product? Do we have a vector or a scalar? Scalar. So we have a scalar and then we can integrate it, no problem. Have you ever had to integrate a vector in this class? The answer is no. But the more correct answer is not yet. <laughs> As we'll see in the finite element method, we have to integrate matrices, basically. For the Bernoulli beams, we have three loads. We have the distributed load Q. We can have concentrated point load P. And we can have concentrated moments F. So our work done in this case will be the integral over the length of the beam of Q times Y. Now, this is kind of iffy. The integral limits are actually just where Q acts. So if Q was going from 0 to L over 2, and then it stops, well, this would be from 0 to L over 2. We have the point loads multiplied by their displacements, and the moments multiplied by their rotations. So it's, it's not too bad at all. If we were to look at our potential energy, and now that we know everything, well, it's actually pretty simple. We have expressions for both the total strain and energy, as well as the work done. So our potential energy for continuums is going to be the following equation. And for beams, it's going to be the following equation. Looks pretty bad, but this is the worst case scenario. When I gave you euler Bernoulli beams, did it have distributed loads and point loads and moments? No, usually just had distributed loads. So these two would go away. And as we've seen, when you just throw this into a program, it's pretty easy to calculate pretty quickly. The thing to keep in mind for these equations are only known as u, only known as y. It's not very clear how we do it. So this is why I said if you like the virtual work method, you'll like this method, because it's going to be the same process. If I were to deal with an euler bernoulli beam, how many equations do we have? How many equations do we have for an euler bernoulli beam? One. One. How many equations do we have in the virtual work method? One. It's how do we get the different equations using this one equation? Well, it's going to be based upon minimizing potential energy. So before we do that, we have to talk about the idea of an approximate solution. So to approximate the displacement, we usually begin with uh, approximations function, and we typically use a polynomial. So let's say that for an Euler Bernoulli beam, I wanted to approximate it with the following solution. As you know from virtual work, the more terms we add, the better the approximation, and our goal is to solve for the A coefficients. So this is why I'm saying it's exactly like virtual work. There's not really much of a difference. How do we do this? Well, to be minimizing potential energy, 
But just like virtual work, we have to consider essential boundary conditions. You guys remember essential boundary conditions? Same thing applies to the Rayleigh Ritz method. In this scenario here, we have a cantilever beam. So on this end, it's going to have zero uh, displacement, zero rotation. And this end is going to have zero shear, zero moment. Would my shear and moment be considered an essential boundary condition? No. We only are worried about displacement as well as rotation. So let's say that I were to approximate it using the following. We know that since at this end, uh, the displacement and rotation is zero, well, then we know that our approximate solution is zero, zero. Well, then A naught has to be zero. We know that the derivative of our approximation, which is rotation at zero is also equal to zero. A1 is equal to zero. What about this end? How does this factor into essential boundary conditions? Does this have any impact on essential boundary conditions? No. Because is there something related to rotation? No. Something related to displacement? No. So at the end of the day, our approximate solution satisfying these essential boundary conditions would be A2 times X1 squared. Not too bad. So after we have an approximation that satisfies those essential boundary conditions, all we can do is we can substitute it in to our potential energy equation. So let's say from the last slide that we have an equation here that satisfies essential boundary conditions, we can substitute it into our equation. Now what's nice here is if we were to look through this, even though it looks really bad, we only have one unknown. EI is something we know. A2, well, that's going to be our known because X1 is just X1. Q is something we know. A2, again, is the unknown. And if we look through here, A2 is going to be our only unknown. If we were to have plus A3, blah, 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 well, then we would also have A3, A4, whatever you want. So the question is, is well, how exactly do we determine those equations? Remember, let's say that we had A2, A3, A4. If I have three unknowns, how many equations do I need? Three equa or sorry, three unknowns, how many equations? Three. How many equations do you have here? One. So just like virtual work, we have to come up with a special way of getting these equations. Well, what we're going to do, oh, actually, this is something I should mention before you all forget, is why is this 2A2X1 and not A2X1 squared? The derivative. Remember, moments are multiplied by rotations. Rotations are the derivative of displacement. Perfect. So you guys know. So what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the potential energy. And here's the key. With respect to the A coefficients. So for instance, if this is my potential energy function, I would take the derivative of it with respect to A2. And since we want it minimal, we know that this is going to be equal to zero. So we have one equation equal to zero, one equation, one unknown. If we also had a three and a four, I would repeat this process with a three, so the derivative with respect to a three, and the derivative with respect to a four. That's why this method is nicer because you don't have to worry about coefficients like virtual work. However many a unknowns you have, that's just how many times you're going to take the derivative. Now I got some juicy questions for you. If we take a derivative of a function, will it always be minimal? Could it be a maximum? Yes. Is there anything in here that I'm doing to check to make sure that it's minimal? Or did I just take a derivative and said, you know what, trust me, it's going to be minimal. Can you guys guarantee me that if I were to take the derivative of my potential energy, it will always be minimal? You know, who's going to say, you know what, Clayton? I promise you. I guarantee you. Thank you. It will be. But why? That's the question now, but why? It's something I don't expect anyone to know, of course. 
but it goes back to the concept of the restrictions of our elastic moduli. Did we have restrictions on E? Did we say that, you know what, for a stable solution, E has to be within a certain range? Yes. What was it? Just greater than zero. What happens is if we ensure that all of the parameters meet those restrictions we talked about, in this case, it's basically just going to be E, we will always have a minimal solution, which is great. We don't have to worry about trying to determine if it's maximal or minimal. So this is all we do. In this case, we only have one unknown, which is A2. We have one equation, all that we can solve for A2. Again, this is equal to zero, nice and simple. If we want, had more coefficients, again, if we had A2, or sorry, A3, A4, A5, well, we would just keep taking derivatives with respect to all the coefficients. Yes? How do you know the sign of the moment? The sign of the moment? It would just follow conventional things. So if it's a positive moment, clockwise, or negative moments, clock, wait, no, positive moments, clockwise, negative moment the other way, it's the same thing for P. If P is going downwards, negative, P is going upwards, positive, just sign convention. So how is virtual or how is the Rayleigh Ritz method? Do you think it's easier than virtual work? No? Let's go through the process. So for a beam, first thing that we want to do, select an approximation function. In this case, we'll do a quad drive right here. Is that the same as virtual work? First step. Is this the exact same? First step is virtual work. Yes. Second step, ensure that this approximation function satisfies our essential boundary conditions. So let's say that we had a pin at x1 is zero. Well, then we can immediately solve for a naught because we know that the displacement has to be zero. Was well, that the exact same as virtual work? Yes. Calculate the internal strain energy of the system. We already talked about for beams, we have a nice equation here. If we have our approximation, we know what this is. EI, well that's the property of the beam, we know what that is. And zero to L plus the length of the beam, so we know what that is. We look right here, we actually have no unknowns. Is this exactly what we did in virtual work? It's not exactly what it is, but it's essentially that. Remember, for virtual work, step three, we calculated the internal virtual work. In Rayleigh Ritz, we're calculating the internal strain energy. After that, we can calculate the work done by external forces. So it's just going to be Q times Y approximate, P times Y approximate, M times sigma approximate. Again, how do I get theta across? How do I get my approximate rotation function? Derivative. I just take the derivative of y. That's it. The last thing I really want to emphasize when it comes to this is is this a general displacement function or is this the displacement at point P? Let's put it this way is this y approx and this y approx the same thing? No. Remember, when it comes to concentrated point loads or moments, it's always the displacement or rotation specifically at that point. So all you do is you take your approximation function and then substitute whatever value of x, p is located at. After that, we can calculate the potential energy of the system by simply taking one term and just subtracting the work. Well, that seems pretty easy. And then after that, everything is good to go because all we're going to do is take the partial derivative of the potential energy, which we calculated above, with respect to all of our remaining A coefficients. So in this particular case, we still had A1 and A2. All I would do is take the potential energy or the derivative with respect to A1, set it equal to zero, take the derivative with respect to A2, set it equal to zero. I have two unknowns. I now have my two equations. You can solve that system of equations for A1 and A2. And that's it. Yep, that was it. So what do you think? Rayleigh Ritz method nice and easy? You guys don't care? I know you don't care. And the reason why I know you don't care is this. 
before I started teaching this class, when do you think I used the Rayleigh Ritz method? When I took this class. And I know that's what you're all thinking. Clayton, this is nice, but the code book looks a lot nicer. The equations are right there. I know none of you probably care about simulation, but you should, because I'm going to be in your capstones and I'm going to be laughing at all your simulations. I promise you. Who's going to take 479? I will be there. I will be there. No. Simulations is one of those things that it's the way of the future. Do you know that? That's the way of the future? Top companies in Edmonton lately for structural, I'm not going to say which companies because I'm being recorded. <laughs> do you think that their last the structural engineering company, do you think their last co-op was civil? A civil engineer? No. Their last co-ops have been computer sciences. Really? Yes. Simulation is the way of the future. Specifically now in Alberta, it's not even about structural simulation. It's about thermal simulation. You guys want to make money? Get good at thermal. Have any of you guys had Yuxing Chen, Dr. Yuxing Chen, Management 30? He's laughing right now. He's our thermal guy. The Alberta Energy Code came out and basically said, here's the new standards in Alberta. None of the None of the building materials, concrete, steel, masonry, they don't know how to comply because it's so strict because of our winter, which actually is actually pretty nice. Like it was a warm up this morning. But basically, they're saying, you need to meet these requirements. And everyone's saying, how? Well, that's when they go to Dr. Yu Xing Chen. And he says, oh, I'd love to help for a fee. <laughs> no, so that's where all the money is right now is in thermal, which is great. That's why I like this, because how did we base upon these methods? How do we derive virtual work, or how did we derive Rayleigh Ritz? In essence, we started with a differential equation. That's all we did is we took a differential equation and we made it nice. Remember, for virtual work, all we did is we took our differential equation, we multiplied it by virtual displacements, and then integrated. That was the whole proof. If I were to give you a differential equation for thermal behavior, could you apply virtual work to it? Yes. Could you simulate it? Yes. That's the nice thing. You don't know it yet, but you have a lot of potential now. Because even though we only covered very specific structural topics, you could apply this to anything. You can go over to 3.30. Who's teaching it this year, Dr. Lowen or Dr. Davies? Dr. Lowen, you can go say, well, you know what? The math is fun, but I now have the differential equation, so I can simulate it. Anything with a differential equation, which, spoiler alert, is everything in the world, you can now simulate using these methods. Again, this is a sleeper course. No, no one takes this course seriously until grad school <laughs> and then they realize oh it's pretty special so that is the Rayleigh Ritz method is there any questions concerning this method yes I didn't learn it the first time so I had to learn it for the first time <laughs> yeah no this is one of those things that I know you guys don't care because I didn't care that's why I'm trying to emphasize it that hey this is actually important it's one of those things that the only way I started remembering this was in course, or 374, structural design. No matter who your structural design professor is, right now it's Dr. Ema Poor. If you're taking it next semester, it's Dr. Driver. They're always going to say, oh, you remember plane sections remain plain. And every student goes, well, yeah, of course, but none of them actually remember. This is where it comes from. It's this course that prepares you for the design classes. So, yeah. And then once I started getting into simulation, I realized, oh, yeah, this is extremely useful. Why do I like simulation? Who knows why I like simulation? I don't know if I talked about it. Simulation is wonderful because it lets you do one specific thing. Well, two specific things. What do you think those two are? 
First one is be lazy. You have no idea. Be lazy. Second one is make money. Isn't that the perfect combination? The reality is this. If you want data on something, and this happens in companies all the time, because again, spoiler alert, you don't have to go to the code book. A lot of companies, especially Wood right now that you'll see, they don't listen to the code book. They do a lot of testing. And they can say, you know what, based on this testing, I can guarantee my product safe. There's two ways of testing. There's analytical models, or there's actual physical experimental testing. Who prefers experimental testing? No, no one. You know why? Have you seen the structural lab? If I wanted to go test something right now, I'm automatically on a three year waiting list. That's the problem with the structural master's degree. A lot of students came and asked me, Clayton, should I do an MEng or an MSc? I always ask one thing, are you gonna be a professor? No, then you're doing an MEng. If you do an MSc, you're gonna be on that three year waiting list too. Who wants to do a three or four year master's degree? No one. Who wants to do a one year MEng degree? Well, I know that you guys probably just wanna leave after undergrad, but if you had to pick between the two, you're picking the image. That's what I recommend. MSc is only good if you want to actually teach. No one wants to teach. I like teaching because I like the concepts. <clears throat> when I look out in the room after you are sleeping, <laughs> makes me feel quite insecure about what I like. <laughs> so it's one of those fun things. So what typically happens, and this actually goes into MSc research, is this. If I wanted to know the behavior of something, let's say a concrete shear wall. I guess you guys haven't dealt with that yet. Let's just say steel beams. You don't go and test a thousand steel beams. You go and test maybe 10 of them. From the 10 of them, you create models based on those tests. And you modify the model so that it is basically identical to the test. Because once you have a good model, can you simulate any scenario as many times as you want? Yes. So you experimental test, let's say 10 things, you create a model, and then with that model, you run thousands of simulations. Without that simulation, you're kind of screwed. That's where they come to me. Because <laughs> I can do all the simulations. And that's why I love this course. Did I say that things were steel? Did I say they were concrete? No, sometimes for fun, but was there a limit on what material you can do? No. So could you, in theory, do an aluminum beam? Yes. How many of you guys have seen the aluminum design code? No one. But could you still design an aluminum beam now? Yes. And the nice thing, too, is this doesn't just apply to structural. I keep it structural because you are civil. Could I go and simulate a car engine? Yes. If I were to simulate a car engine, do you think I'm using virtual work? Yes. Isn't that crazy? My last job offers weren't structural at all. The most recent one was mechanical. You get a lot of mechanical. They love to simulate things. And before that, it was geotechnical. Do you think that soil can be simulated? Yes, that's the beautiful thing. If you're really good at this, you can do anything you want. Chemical process, processes, same thing. It's just different differential equations. So that's my little, I don't know, uh, lecture? No, <laughs> I have no idea. We'll go through the examples really quick. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. So let's go to this. I promise you one of the questions on the final will be something like this where it's basically, what is the Rayleigh-Ritz method? And there's two distinct things in these statements. The first one is you'll see exact solution or approximate solution. Exact solution, approximate solution. What is the Rayleigh-Ritz method? Is it an exact solution or an approximate solution? Approximate. So right from there, we can eliminate some of these. So part A says exact solution. We know that's not true. Same with part C. Can you by coincidence 
obtain the exact solution using the rarely writs method? Yes. If your exact solution is, a, again, a fourth order polynomial, and your assumption is that it is a fourth order polynomial, it'll become the exact solution. The next key thing is what exactly does it do? So in part B here, approximate solution for the displacement in a continuum by minimizing the internal strain energy of the continuum. The second one is by minimizing the potential energy of the system. So which one's it going to be? Are we minimizing the internal strain energy or are we minimizing the potential energy? Potential energy. We need the internal strain energy, but remember, we take that internal strain energy and we subtract the work done on the system. So we know that it's not going to be the internal strain energy, it's the potential energy of the system. So that's not too bad at all. I forgot the, the solution key, but these are actually pretty simple. It's just this one problem, and I like it because uh, it can address a lot of questions that I got concerning virtual work, because it's going to be the same thing. So an approximate solution using the rayleigh hertz method is sought for the shown unit thickness plate. So it gives us an approximation function. It says, as a first step in the method, a displacement function that satisfies the essential boundary conditions is obtained as this. So we're assuming that right now this function already satisfies the essential boundary conditions. It says where a1, a2, a3, and a4 are constant. If the distributed traction vector t, 1, 0, is applied on edge A, which is edge over here, what is the work done by external forces acting on edge A? The reason why I like this is because this right here is the same as virtual work. And this was the only question I got about assignment 9. So if you get this one, you're ready for uh, virtual work as well. So if you were to go to the notes, we said that the work done on the system for a continuum is the integral over the surface of our traction vector dotted with our displacement vector. And again, we're integrating over the surface. So before we get to the integral, what I typically like to do in these problems is solve for, well, what, what exactly are we integrating? So here's going to be the first one. I've seen this maybe from two or three students in the assignment. What are we doing? What, oh, let's start off simple. What is Tn, a vector or a scalar? What is our displacement function? Vector. We're dotting them together. So what should we get? Scalar. So that's going to be the first thing. Is the function that we integrate in these problems should always be a scalar at the end. So if you see two vectors and you see a dot, chances are this means dot product, not just multiplied together. So we're gonna come down here and say, okay, we know that all we're doing for dot product is just multiplying the components together. So for Tn, our first component is one. You guys see it kind of in the corner over there? It's one. And we're multiplying this by the first component of our displacement vector which is a1x1 plus a2 times x2. So let's see if I can keep it on screen here. a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2. Then we move on to the second components. So the second component of attraction vector is zero. So we're gonna have plus zero times a3 times x1 plus a4 times x, I guess this would be x2. What's nice is that zero basically cancels out everything on that side. So I'm just gonna come down here. So we know that this is just going to be a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2. So that's what we have. We know that if we're looking for the work done on the system, it's going to be the integral over the surface of a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2. So that's the first, first one. 
we use dot product. The second thing is, and this is what I got the most questions about is, well, how exactly do we do this? Because it's not over the volume, it's over a surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we have basically three directions. I'm going to uh, switch to kind of a dotted thing here, is even though we modeled this in 2D, we know that this kind of has a unit thickness into the page, kind of like this. So what we're essentially doing, and I'll switch back to normal, is we're integrating this surface right here. So your integration limits when you deal with the surface are going to be based on the edges of the surface. So you can see one of the edges is this one right here. Now, is this in the x1 or the x2 direction? <clears throat> x2. You see how we're going vertically. So that's going to be one of our integration limits. It has to be x2. The second one is this edge right here. Now, which direction does this edge go here? x3 goes into the page. So my integration limits for this surface have to be with respect to x2 and with respect to x3. That's the key thing here. So I'm going to come down here and say, okay, well, this is actually equal to the integral or the double integral. So I'm just going to keep it like this for now. I'm going to put my function back in a1 x1 plus a2 x2. And we know we have to integrate with respect to x2 and we have to integrate with respect to x3. Does it matter if we do x3 then x2? We're dealing with simple functions. The order of this doesn't matter for this course. The order is technically important because we have to find these integration limits. So for this first integral here, is this going to be x2 or x3? x2 is the closest one. So I'm going to go back up here, and we're going to look at this figure. If this was my beam, what are my integration limits for x2? Zero to two, zero to one. Again, we're going over this surface, which goes from zero to here, and up here is one. So we're gonna come down here, we're gonna say, okay, our first one, zero to one. Our second one, of course, is with respect to X3, and X3 is that direction into the, into the cliff. We said that that's a unit thickness, so that will also be zero to one. Again, where did I get that from? It says that uh, unit thickness into the page. So zero to one. Now I'm going to skip a step and I'm going to show you why later on. So for now, we got our functions. We can actually integrate. So our first one is with respect to x2. So this is going to be equal to, actually, let's just do the, the inside. Let's say we're just focused on this first integral right here. We know that this is going to be a1, x1, x2, plus a2 over 2, x2 squared, evaluated from 0 to 1. Does everyone see where that comes from? Perfect. So we say, okay, this is going to be a1, x1, plus a2 over 2. So that's that first integral. Then what we're going to do is we're going to substitute that back in our equation. So now we're taking the integral from 0 to 1 of a1, x1, plus a2 over 2 with respect to x3. If we were to do this integral, it's also pretty simple. We're going to have a1, x1, x3, plus a2 over 2, x3, evaluated from 0 to 1, and we get that that's going to be equal to a1 
x1 plus a2 over 2. So now we're done with all of our integrals, and we get this. Is there a problem? Who's saying not clean? No problem. We are good to go. No one? Who thinks there is a problem? Who knows what that problem is? So you just believe me that there is a problem. Here's what's going to happen. And I've seen this a couple times for external virtual work. So it applies there and applies here too. After you're done calculating the work, you should never have a variable. We have x1. Same thing goes for external virtual work. When you calculate that, you should never have a variable left. Same thing here, we have a variable left, we have a problem. Does it make sense that we have a variable left after our integration? Yes. We integrated with respect to x2, so that'll get rid of all the x2s. We integrated with respect to x3, so I'll get rid of all the x3s, but we didn't do anything with x1. And that's why we have an x1 left. But how do we get rid of this x1? I heard it softly. What is x1 at this point right here? Two, up at this point. How about this point? Are we here? Here? Two. That's the key thing about the surface. This entire surface is when x1 is equal to 2. So that's what we have to do. We know that this is going to happen when x1 is equal to 2, the location of the surface. So we get 2a1 plus a2 over 2. And that's it. That will be the work done on the system by the traction vector. Again, do we want it in terms of a1 and a2? Yes. Because what we're going to do is this would later go into our potential energy equation, which we would take the derivative of to solve for these coefficients. So it's not too bad at all. That's the example I wanted to go over. But one other thing I want to talk about really quick, because this will allude to the finite element method, is was this hard? Was the integration x2 and x3 difficult? No. Why? Simple shape. What happens if our shape looks something like this? You go home, exactly. What do we do then? This is why we need the finite element method. Everything that we've done has been simple shapes. And we're lucky as engineers that we're not very creative. Look at this room. Is this room a simple shape? Basically. But then you get the architects who are creative saying, well, you know what, I, I got big plans. That's when you get scared. And then they give you something crazy. They'll give you something like this. And they say, okay, well, design it. You're saying, what? So what do we do in this case? If you think you're going to find this case in the code book, <laughs> oh, you're in for a big surprise. What we do in the finite element method is we take this complex shape and we split it into very little rectangles. That's what we do for the entire thing. We split it into a bunch of rectangles. Now, some of you are saying, well, you know what, Clayton, if you look at that rectangle there, it's still a little bit curved. Just a little bit. But that's okay because we use special math to take this case and convert it into a perfect square. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. I can't wait to teach you this, even though you will get very bored. Do you remember in math how if you couldn't do the integration in one coordinate system, you would switch to the other and come back? That's what we do in finite element method. 
we split a big problem into a small problem, we convert that to a different coordinate system, and then we find the results and go back to this coordinate system. And once we have the results here, we put it back into the entire system. Yeah, all I see is a lot of, no, no, no. But yes, 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 yes. This will be the concept we'll talk about on the Tuesday lecture next week. So that's it for today. I'm going to go out a little bit early, which is nice. Does anyone have any questions, concerns, anything else? Yes, Thursday is online. Thursday is another mathematical. So we won't be meeting in person until next, next Tuesday. And next Tuesday will be our last in-person lecture. All right. Perfect. You all have a wonderful day. And let me know if you need any.